Hello everybody. So uh, this week we're going to be talking about soil organic matter. It's going to be a brief lecture, but it's actually, I think that ties in well with our ideas of soil organic matter. And so what is soil organic matter? It's basically it's all organic substances in the soil. So um, another way to say that is the organic fraction of the soil that includes plant, animal, and microbial residues in various stages of decomposition, biomass of soil or microorganisms, and substances produced by plant roots and other soil organisms. Although all organic substances in the soil also covers that. Uh, the material in the soil that is derived from other living organisms, that's soil organic matter. Mostly we're talking about plant tissue. Uh, that's, that's the majority of what we're talking about. Are we also talking about, um, you know, poop from animals and, and, uh, decay from animals and that sort of stuff as well? Yeah, but that, but mostly we're talking about plant tissue. Uh, even though soil organic matter is, uh, only a small quantity of the soil, which is one to five percent of the soil it performs a wide array of functions and it, it really outperforms itself in terms of of the small amount that it is it influences practically all physical biological and chemical properties in the soil pretty much all of them are affected by um by organic matter and by organic matter content so it is small but it packs a wallop so the composition of, of humus. Humus, not hummus. Talk about that all the time. Hummus you eat. Humus is partially degraded organic matter. It is a dark amorphous compound. If you don't know what amorphous means, it means you just don't know what, what you're looking at. If we look at this picture of, of humus on the right here, I'm not sure. I can see some stuff that used to be twigs. I can see some stuff that used to be grass, maybe. And But there's a bunch of stuff where I don't know what it is. And that's what we mean. It's a dark amorphous compound. It's it's a combination of modified lignin, which is the stuff that gives uh, structural stability uh, in woody materials, amino acids, and nitrogenous compounds. It contains um, mostly carbon, and then, then there's... Um, Minimal amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus in there, as, as well as oxygen and other things. Um, eventually, it'll deg it degrade. It, it will degrade to carbon dioxide and water. Uh, carbon dioxide, water, if uh, oxygen is present. It does. It doesn't have a good bearing strength. If you have a, a, a soil with high organic matter, you don't want to be um, doing construction in those soils. You want to be growing things in those soils, though. Um, whether that's trees or crops or that sort of thing, because you're going to get really good results with that, but you don't want to um, construct things in that soil. Uh, and your net charge is negative, and that's important when it gets to the idea of the cation exchange, because those positive cations will then be be attracted to that because of that negative charge. More about the uh, composition of humus. Uh, it can absorb more water per unit, uh, per unit weight than clay. It's got a really high capacity to absorb water, which is fantastic for soils. It can hold more nutrients per unit than clay. Also extremely important. Uh, in terms of aggregate stability, we'll talk about it in detail later, but it, but it helps, uh, to form aggregates and, and, um, provide for stability in the soil. It's got a net-like three-dimensional structure that coats the mineral particles. And about two to five percent of the hummus, uh, hummus, look at me, even me making the mistakes. Two to five percent of the humus decomposes per year depending on your climatic conditions. If you have, um, uh, moist and cool climate, decompose a lot faster. If you got hot and dry, uh, not gonna, uh, decompose as much. Really, it's, it's that, that precipitation. So, you know, place where you get, um, like the south where you get hot and moist. You get, um, you're gonna get hot, much higher rates of decomposition. So where does organic matter come from? All organic matter, really, it's coming from uh, plant tissue, and then um, the important step in there is gonna be uh, the microbes are gonna be the ones that decompose organic matter, uh, and they do this to subs to sustain their own life processes. So if we look at it as a four-step process, plant matter is turned into soil bringing with it nutrients and carbon. Step two, that's where the microbes come in. 
They release some stored nutrients from the plant matter, making them available. The nutrients released by the microbes are then taken up by the plants, and then the microbes generate more organic micro matter, continuing the cycle and building stored nutrients in the soil. So, factors that affect uh, humus formation. Moist and cool climates favor the production of organic matter. Hot and dry climates do not. Just think about the desert. Uh, if you have hot and dry, you don't have uh, that many organisms and, um, and that many um, plants uh, growing in those areas. And without that stuff, you're not going to get that plant tissue. Without the plant tissue, you're not going to have soil organic matter. Um, and the, another way to just think about it also is the idea of um, how many things... When, when you have the right conditions where you can have lots of animals, lots of organism, lots of plants and all that going, you're going to end up with more organic matter. When you have something like the desert where you don't have as many animals or plants around, you're not going to, you're just not going to see as much organic matter. You just need all that activity to be, to happen, have it happen. Prairie soils are going to be richer in, in humus than forested soils. Forested soils are going to have a lot of humus near the soil, but the grassland um, soils can have humus uh, all the way down to uh, one to two feet deep into the soil because of the um, of that um, grass material um, cycling through the soil. Cultivated soils like farms are going to have a lower humus content, a lower organic matter content. Uh, the whole idea is um, behind behind um the idea of good crop production uh good crop production um processes these days is to try and um have more plant residues and provide for slower decomposition so uh, before it was you know clear everything off and start again now we want to um, basically leave those plant residues on our soil let that let those work their way and decompose into the soil um one of and the no-till or low-till uh, farming practices are the ones that are going to favor um, having a higher organic uh, matter content in your soil. And so uh, one of, that's one of the main advantages of the no-till or low-till uh, farming is, is this high organic matter content. And high organic matter content means better soil. Better soil means better crops. So here's our comparison of uh, forest versus prairie organic matter. And you can see right here, it says above ground biomass and root zone biomass above ground. You're going to see forest soil just dominates in terms of the idea of organic matter. But then you get below, below ground, you get into the root zone biomass and your prairie organic matter dominates your, uh, your uh, forested organic matter. So... Uh, we can see here you get that big thick layer on the surface of organic matter much and you might not even have that that o layer here in the grassland soil but you're going to get that nice brown this dark brown soil where you get that organic matter that just keeps penetrating deep you're going to get that much deeper than you're going to see it in the forested soil uh and it's just a lot more a uh, lot more organic matter underneath the the soil in in grassland soils. So let's kind of look at at that O layer um, that O layer because that's really where we're going to see uh, the majority of our of our humus and our organic matter. Uh, for it to be an O layer, it's got to be greater than twenty percent soil organic carbon by weight. You're going to have three sub layers. Uh, that could be present in the O layer, your OI, your OE, and your OA. OI is slightly decomposed. You can still identify the plant and animal material. Okay, there's a twig there, there's a blade of grass there, that sort of thing. OE, intermediately de decomposed, can identify some plant parts. There's like part of a twig there, there's part of some grass there, there's, there's a pine that's part of a pine needle. OA, highly decomposed, you cannot identify the original source of the material. You're just looking at it and you're like, ah, this is all humus. I cannot tell what this used to be. So there's two classifications of organic matter. There's uh, active organic matter and stable organic matter. We've been mostly talking about humus and, and your book focuses on humus. That's the stable 
organic matter. The active organic matter, uh, that's the part that's actually decomposing. Uh, it's it's the one that fuels microbial activity and releases nutrients into the soil. Uh, those are easy for microbes to digest and use for metabolism. Your fresh crop residues um, will be a good source of active organic matter, and that's why we want to have those crop residues and, and go for that no-till, low-till um, process to just allow those um, crop residues to slowly decompose into the soil. And this can change growing season to growing season. Your stable organic matter, that stuff is already decomposed. Like we said, um, humus uh, is what makes up uh, your stable organic matter. And when we look at humus, we're, we're not quite sure what it is. For the most part, it's already decomposed. We, 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 know, we know that because we look at it and we can't really tell what it used to be. Uh, it makes up the majority of soil organic matter. 60 to 90 percent of soil organic matter is, is this stable organic matter. As the soil organisms digest and decompose the material, several things happen. The chemistry of the organic matter gets modified. The nutrients are removed as the microbes decompose the material. And then the organic matter will stick to soil particles. And that's how the soil, soil and organic matter work together. The stable organic matter is then going to accumulate when the active microbes continually are decomposing organic matter. So here's kind of a look at this in terms of uh, a time scale. So you get your fresh crop residues or whatever they are. Uh, you know, some after some days, we've released some CO2. After some months, we've released some CO2. We're contributing to soil organism biomass and at metabolism this whole time. After some years, we were still releasing some CO2. We've got some, um, so we've got it in our aggregates. And after decades, we finally get to this stable organic matter and it's uh, fixed to soil particles and attached to soil particles. So it, it's, it takes quite a while for this process to happen, for it to go from active organic matter to stable organic matter and that's that's the process it, it doesn't just happen overnight sort of a thing it's it's a year years long thing and then when you actually think about it in terms of uh, soil formation and soil process you, you go oh decades that's a long time well not when it comes to soil when it comes to soil this is actually a pretty quick process if we're only talking decades when we you know before we mentioned stuff about it taking 100 years to to create an inch of topsoil sort of a thing a, a decade no big deal a couple decades no big deal that's that's small in the uh in the world of of soil time so let's go over some benefits of soil organic matter uh quickly those ideas, water retention and drainage, cation exchange capacity, soil structure, microbial diversity and resiliency, uh, nutri nutrient cycling and retention, and crop yield. So, we did it quickly, now let's do it in detail. Cation exchange capacity. So, plant available form of most nutrients is as an ion, and the cation is the positive charge version of that. And because we said earlier that uh, that our organic matter yields a net negative charge, that works out perfectly for these cations, which are positive charged, and we can get that cation exchange going that we just talked about in our last lecture. Soil organic matter provides between 20 and 80 percent of the cation exchange capacity in mineral soils, which far, far, far exceeds the capabilities of clay, which means in terms of cation exchange, or the more organic matter you have, the higher your the cation exchange capacity is going to be, and the more likely the soil is going to retain nutrients, which is fantastic for our soils, and just another benefit of why having organic matter in your soils is a great thing. It's going to protect your nutrient availability and your plant health in your soil. In terms of aggregation and soil structure, so as the soil particles stick and bind together, they form ag aggregates, active and stable organic matter get trapped in these aggregates, and the soil particles basically act as armor to protect the organic matter um, from attack by decomposers. The, um, why is it important for, for soil organic matter to be in, in soil and in these aggregates? They're, they, we want soil to form aggregates because we want, if they form aggregates, that's going to create more pore space. And it, 
And because we know how important water and air are to soil, the idea that aggregation happens and organic matter contributes to that in, in forming those aggregates, and then that allows us to have pore space is, is just another fantastic benefit of soil organic matter. The majority of soil organic matter, we've said, is the result of decomposition and aggregation that has occurred during a long time. And a healthy soil has a mix of active and stable organic matter because you want that process to be constantly happening. So in order for that to happen, you need a steady supply of organic inputs. Crop residues is the one that we've mentioned um, uh, the most. Manure is another one if we've got um, if rangelands with, uh, with animals on them. Um, but just any way that we can really get plant tissues um, into, into the soil uh, is going to help and build and maintain uh, active and stable organic matter pools. And that's just going to provide a wide array of benefits to the soil. But really, I mean, if you haven't figured it out by now, just soil organic matter is going to provide a wide array of benefits if you have large amounts of it. So in terms of soil structure, active organic matter forms sticky substances that help soil particles bind together. We just mentioned that. So physically, what does that mean? It means better aeration because we got the pore space, better friability, less crusting, better water infiltration, drainage, and retention. And in terms of biological benefits, now we've got homes for microbes, worms, insects, and all these other uh, organisms that are going to form our soil food web, which we'll talk about when we talk about soil organisms, and then also food storage. It's, it provides a slow release of food for those microbes to do their process and help us create more organic matter. Nice, nice, um, nice um, working relationship there. In terms of water retention and drainage, soil organic matter increases the ability of a soil to receive and hold more water. So um, the particulate organic matter in soil serves as a lightweight, low-density bulking agent, like a sponge, which is absolutely what you want. You want it to hold water. And the best part is, when you think about a sponge, is it holds water, but it's still going to let go of that water. It's not going to hold that water forever, but it's going to hold it for a lot longer than if it didn't have that, um, that bulking agent. Um, plant residues that are spongy and absorptive also can swell and retain uh, water. And so that's the idea, especially in certain certain areas where water might become a limiting factor, the idea that you that you have organic matter that can hold and slowly release water is is fantastic. In terms of nutrient cycling and retention, active organic matter is full of fresh and accessible nutrients. As soil organisms break down and decompose uh, soil organic matter, the nutrients will be consumed by those soil organisms and then released into the solution. When they're released into the solution, they are free for uptake by plants and other organisms, or they're going to be lost to leaching and volatilization. That's the cation exchange can, comes in there as well, because once those nutrients become free for uptake, that's where we can get that exchange happening. As long as active organic matter is decomposing, it will provide a slow and steady supply of nutrients into the soil solution. So a slow and steady supply of nutrients is exactly what you want. It's not going to be too much. It's not going to be too little. And it's going to keep coming. And that's exactly what you want. In terms of microbial diversity, diversity and resiliency, soil microbes are important for driving this nutrient cycle and influencing the availability of nutrients to the plants. It provides that source of nutrients and energy to the microbes, and it's important for creating and maintaining soil microbial habitat. So um, the species diversity of microbes requires a variety of habitat conditions in the soil, including aerobic and anaerobic conditions, wet and dry conditions, nutrient-rich and nutrient-poor conditions, and large and small pore spaces, all things where soil organic matter has um, plays a role. Organic matter helps create a mix of these conditions and a variety of homes to support the diversity that we rely on for soil function. In terms of crop yield, a recent review of yield and soil organic matter indicated that soil organic matter content can influence crop yield, but only to a point. While increased organic matter may impact yield to a point, its collective benefits on soil productivity, structure, and health are substantial and should uh, should not be ignored. So it's only going to um, boost crop yield 
to a certain extent, but the idea that it's going to make your soil more productive, make your soil have better structure and better health, that in itself is still extremely substantial. So how do we build more soil organic matter? So soil organic matter and microbes are going to be important for soil health. For the microbes to grow and do their many jobs, they're going to need the food. So they need more plant residues um, and decomposing plant tissue. They need that strong house. They need um, so that, that place to live where they feel comfortable. And then the freedom from drastic phys physical and chemical disturbances. So what they really want is they just want there to be a bunch of organic matter so they are happy and can do what they, they need to do. To build organic matter, build the below ground habitat. So if microbes are incorporating active organic matter into their body, stale, stable soil organic matter pool is also going to grow because we'll keep that, that cycle, that chain growing. And then living roots are also a great way to keep microbes happy because that gives them a high quality uh, food source, which is going to boost their activity as well. Here's kind of um, a couple a couple little things. So, how do we build or uh, um, soil organic matter? Minimize disturbance. Keep the soil covered with living roots. Focus on soil resiliency and jack up your diversity. More diversity, more um, different nutrients in the soil. Fantastic. And managing soil organic matter is the key to air and water quality. So if we can work on this stuff here, cover crops, reduce tillage, prescribe grazing, manure management, high biomass bio rotations, that gets us to good soil health, high organic matter, high water holding capacity, large amounts of organisms, good infiltration, high amounts of nutrients, good structure, gets us to less sediment and less erosion, less drought and or more drought and disease resistance, fewer pollutants and less dust. All good stuff. How do you destroy soil organic matter? Because it's really, really important to note that if we can build it, we can probably also screw it up too. So soil organic matter builds when the soil is occupied by vegetation and not disturbed. So if you get physical disturbance like tillage, that's going to um, that's going to break up that soil structure that's holding and protecting the organic matter. And so you, um, you also um, are exposing the protected organic matter to decomposers and um, soil aeration is going to result in a rapid loss of organic carbon uh, it, through the carbon cycle as carbon dioxide. Uh, your residue removal, so if you take off your crop residues, all that stuff that should be decomposing into the soil, that's going to be... Um, that's going to be important because you're basically you're losing your food energy source. And then erosion. If you get topsoil or, or these crop residues or anything to erode away, then you're not going to, um, you're not going to have the soil or mat organic matter buildup that you want. And topsoil has the highest concentration of soil organic matter in it because that's where our, our fine absorbing roots are and, and everything. And that's all perfect. But topsoil is also the part of the soil that could easily erode away if you don't um, have the right um, the right processes in place when you're uh, when you're working the, the the land and that's what I got for you like I said organic matter is a small fraction of the soil but it does so much just like this was a small lecture but full of a lot of information so hopefully you uh, you think of soil organic matter as being just as important as I do